in information systems and um, supply chain of RMIT University. Um, this is the series called Research, Research Conversations, and the aim of the series in the school is to bridge the conversation between industry and academia. Now, before I go too far, I'd like to also acknowledge the people of the Wai Wurrung and Bun Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations this morning, whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university and our mighty university and I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. So um, once again, welcome. We call we say woman Jika. And uh, who am I? I am, my name is Nava Subramania. I am a professor of accounting and also currently holding the position of Deputy Dean Research and Innovation within the school. Uh, and um, I will be the um, a person who would be coordinating the, um, the, the session today. Um, so definitely a very topical issue and I'm and I welcome everyone because the impact of COVID-19 on the not-for-profit sector has has um, never been greater. I mean it's been it's absolutely um, unprecedented. It's a word that has been used everywhere in I believe but these are unprecedented times uh, and I think that personally um, having done some, some research in this area that we haven't seen the worst yet. There, there's lots to come. Uh, sorry, if, if anyone is, can you please mute your mic? Okay, so let me get through the um, housekeeping here as well. Can everyone please mute your mic? Can, um, Rohan, are you able to systematically mute everyone's mic? And then when they have to talk, and when you would like to say something towards the end of this webinar, uh, you can uh, click on the mic. So this session will be, this webinar is will be recorded. So just to let you know, if you're not um, wanting your, uh, uh, wanting to participate, then, uh, you know, uh, let us know. But this re this session is being recorded. So mics off and also uh, cameras off, please, because it really helps. We have got about a hundred and uh, nearly 150 people here this morning. So it's a very big group. So it'll really help with the bandwidth. So some people, you know, if you can turn off your cameras, except for the three speakers. Um, OK, and also questions until uh, the end. OK, so please save your question. We have a Q&A towards the end of the session, and today's session will end at quarter past 12. All right, so as I was saying, um, the um, genesis or the motivation for this webinar is the pandemic's impact on our Australian communities and also that that impact has not been equal. That's a real concern. Um, the resilience for these charities, not for profit organizations is even more critical. And so our collective commitment to promoting new and more impactful pathways is really, really important. And um, this is why the School of uh, Accounting, um, Information Systems and Supply Chain, we, we are um, wanting, to, uh, we are looking to um, get some really high quality research undertaken in this area and have invited three very, very um, uh, high profile um, experts in the area. So without further ado, I'm going to do some brief introductions to our three panelists and our three panelists are Professor David Gilchrist, Dr. Vinita Godinho and Mr. Mel Yates from ACNC. Um, so I'll start with uh, David 
and everybody has 15 minutes to uh, speak. After um, we will save all questions until the end of this um, uh, panelists presentations are over. OK, now um, it is my absolute great pleasure having worked with David David before to introduce you to Professor David Gilchrist from the University of Western Australia. David is also a co-convener for the not-for-profit UWA and um, in University of Western Australia, Maine, and also co-convener of the Australian Studies Research Group. Uh, David has held various senior positions within government and uh, not-for-profit human services sector, and his career spans more than 25 years. He's published over 70 industry reports, uh, including one with me, thanks David, on um, the mergers and amalgamations in um, the not-for-profit sector. So, um, David, I'd like to invite you to uh, to know more about David. You can go on to his website at UWA. But David, please, um, I, I'd love to um, invite you to start our our webinar today. Thank you very much, Nava, and thank you to Nava and the RMIT group and my colleague presenters for the opportunity. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, or rather acknowledge, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation on whose land I meet, uh, and to uh, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, in deciding what to say over my very strictly governed 15 minutes that Nava's been generous in giving me, I wanted to, I guess, preface my comments by making a couple of comments around the work that I do and also where I see COVID uh, sitting in the context of both um, human services uh, sustainability in this country and also the administrative processes around managing uh, human services. So first and foremost, the work that I do is very much uh, involved in looking at sustainability in human services organisations in Australia uh, from the perspective of mission sustainability rather than corporate sustainability. In other words, how do we ensure that those organisations have the capacity to continue to pursue their mission uh, and what kinds of things do we need to do to support them to do that? And that breaks down into two fundamental areas, I guess, the traditional academic outputs, uh, which of course are important and what I call that foundational research. But of um, most of my career, I've spent working very closely with industry, government, peak bodies and organisations uh, to drive that as well. And that's really the basis or the, the perspective I want to come from in relation to my 15 minutes of fame today. That is, what has COVID uh, meant for these organisations and I think the most important question is how do we move forward after this in order to mitigate the kinds of issues that we're struggling to face at the moment. In that regard, I see COVID as a catalyst for bringing us back to some fundamentals around how we ensure the sustainability of human services going forward. In other words, there's no doubt in anyone's mind, I don't think that COVID has been one of the most substantial challenges that Australia has had to face. And certainly when we think about aged care, disability services and so on, all of those activities are really impacted by uh, how COVID operates, but also how we've reacted to COVID, both from a government policy perspective and how peaks have been able to, or in many respects, unable to support their sectors in responding adequately. And so I wanna share some slides and some commentary around uh, what I see as perhaps uh, the experience that we've endured, what the um, uh, catalyst of COVID has identified for us, and to make some suggestions about way forward uh, before I hand on to my co-speakers. So I'll share my slides now. Hopefully you'll be able to see my screen. So uh, please let the moderators know if you can't. Um, in that regard, I think that there's a number of shortfalls in relation to the way we've approached COVID. And I don't think anyone doubts that those shortfalls have been um, been uh, realised. First and foremost, I think there's been a real lack of information in relation to the key issues surrounding COVID and particularly such things as what, how many staff, what do they do, what are their key services and how do we prioritise resource allocations between the various human services activities in Australia. 
I guess the key lesson here is that while we collect a lot of data around the sector, data of course is not information. And I'm not sure that we actually collect the right data to be able to make these decisions or to inform reactions to things like COVID, either in terms of the health impacts or in terms of the economic impacts. What does that mean? At the end of the day, it means that there's really effectively a lack of response due to the complexity, the applicability uh, or otherwise, and the inappropriateness of some of the um, suggestions that are being put forward. For instance, in terms of complexity, I think the lack of information around the sector and how it's structured has meant that government struggled in treasuries and human services departments around the country to be able to develop a, a adequate economic or health response to who support human services organisations. The responses that were developed were arguably either inapplicable or inappropriate for human services activity. And I think this is particularly true in, say, for instance, disability services under the NDIS, where in fact a lot of the COVID economic responses were based around organisations losing income. Many human services involved in uh, organisations involved in disability services that had increases in, in income, but commensurate increases in costs that really attacked their economic viability. So I think having that understanding acknowledging the applicability or otherwise or the inappropriateness of those responses is a set of lessons we really need to learn. In terms of complexity though, I think there is an additional issue around that for not-for-profit and charitable organisations that aren't necessarily used to responding to things like the JobKeeper allowance, making decisions about whether that applies to them or not and how they might move forward on that. Certainly the work that um, I and my team did around JobKeeper showed, I think, very clearly that organisations in the not-for-profit and charitable human services sector were not well placed to be able to uh, make decisions in that regard. What does that mean then? It means that there's increased risk. Increased risk in terms of clinical risk, OCH health and safety risk and financial risk for these organisations. In many respects, primary health care was never questioned in terms of resourcing uh, for the response to COVID. And in Australia, of course, we've had much less or a much better experience, if I can put it that way, of COVID than many other countries have had. However, none of our primary health systems reduced investment or preparedness in terms of the potential epidemic response or outcome that could have occurred. However, in human services, we tend to take less of a clinical uh, risk perspective and an OCH health and safety risk perspective and focus more on financial risk, uh, but perhaps also focus on the idea that some of these services are not required in order to support people in their day-to-day uh, -day lives. And this is, I think, particularly important in the context of things like very complex disability services or uh, in-situ aged care services. That increased risk then means that there are increased costs associated with this response. Those costs relate to government, to service providers, providers and ultimately to service users. And at the end of the day, in terms of human services, of course, service users are the shock absorbers of everything that goes wrong in the system. They ultimately take the risk for the system and they ultimately have to respond to that. So at the end of the day, those increased costs are manifest now as a result of things like JobKeeper being rolled out. But what is less manifest or obvious perhaps to many policy makers is the fact that at the end of the day, there is going to be quite a substantial reconstruction cost to putting all of this back together when it's finished. And I think being able to understand not only the implemental, uh, the, the uh, response costs, but understanding the nature of the ongoing reconstruction costs is a really important part of the information flow that needs to accrue out of the COVID uh, experience. Finally, I would say that the real problem or, or tragedy, I think, out of many of these things, and Everyone would recall that we've had SARS, we've had a number of instances since the economy was opened up in the 1980s of um, uh, requirements to pump prime the economy, for instance, uh, but we don't seem to be uh, bringing learnings together out of this process and perhaps responding by developing some preemptive uh, arrangements to help better. In other words, at the end of the day, I think being able to prioritise and develop administrative process around um, things like the potential for future COVIDs or future economic outcomes 
not only helps to ensure efficiency and effectiveness into the future uh, in terms of those uh, responses, but it also helps to build confidence in the sector more broadly and particularly confidence when these kinds of um, um, issues hit, crises hit uh, for the organisations involved in the sector to be able to respond accordingly. If we don't think about the learnings and if we don't prioritise those learnings to develop an administrative structure that can help us to plan better, then at the end of the day, the next time this happens, we'll end up back at the same situation. As much as much information and much reporting is being done uh, in relation to data collected around the sector, at the end of the day, perhaps we're not collecting the right information, or more importantly, perhaps we are learning, but we're not actually applying those learnings to preparatory work to be able to respond to the next time round. So to that extent, I think there's a few extra things that are really important to be thinking about. In terms of Commonwealth and state responses, I think there was a communication shortfall uh, because at the end of the day, it was very difficult to communicate directly to organisations um, how things like JobKeeper should work and what the, um, the tricks of the trade were in relation to achieving an outcome in relation to that but also because the uh, organisations didn't have a set communications plan to roll out in the case of a crisis. And I think this is a really important issue. Again, if I think about disability services, but I think the same thing occurred uh, in aged care and other human services, there wasn't a clear path to, through peak bodies to industry to be able to get one single um, information set down to organisations and to be able to control and manage that information so that everyone had the information that they needed. Indeed, we've seen a proliferation of different types of responses within the sector. And I understand why those responses have occurred uh, because there has been a void there or a vacuum uh, of, uh, of capacity for leadership in relation to that. I think that vacuum is caused because there's a, a lack of planning or um, a lack of foreseeability in terms of how we might respond to the next economic and or health crisis that hits us. I think the sector's lack of capacity to respond to is a big issue and something that needs to be taken into consideration because at the end of the day, these responses are expensive and they are impacting the um, users of services. And as I said before, those users are the people that are actually the shock absorbers of the system. They're the ones that have to uh, pick up the pieces ultimately at the end of the day. So I guess if we don't learn from what we've done, then there will be further cost in time and money next time around. And I think there will be a next time around. These things are, I think, predictable, not to timing, but certainly uh, in terms of um, uh, pump priming in economic uh, extremists, but also in health outcomes. And I think with the way the world works, at the moment, the, the um, cross-border trading, the amount of movement of people and so on, there's probably a greater opportunity or risk for those health outcomes than we've ever seen before. I think the second thing is really important to think about, and that's where academics come in. That is the lack of necessary data to be able to take these learnings and turn them into administrative process to reduce the impact of the next, uh, next time round. And that lack of necessary data, I think, is twofold. Firstly, we don't really understand what data is out there and what data is available to us uh, because there is much administrative and other data sitting in government departments. And one of the key learnings that came out of the COVID response in states as well as at the Commonwealth was the lack of ability of governments to share data between departments as much as uh, sharing data with the broader community or with sections of industry within that community. So the lack of necessary data relates to whether or not we as academics are writing, uh, asking the right question, whether governments are collecting the right data, but also whether we're able to use that data because we know it exists, we have access to it, uh, and we're able to leverage that in our research, but also able to leverage that in terms of industry usage against the next time around. What are the required mitigations then? And I realise I'm talking very quickly, but I'm scared Nava's going to cut me off after my 15 minutes, so I need to, to keep going. I think there's a number of required mitigations, and obviously I'm simplifying my presentation and simplifying my result, my, my suggestions uh, to the group, and I'll be very interested to get comments, feedback, questions, um, and hear what others uh, in the presentation panel have to say in regard to some of these comments. But at the end of the day, I think the required mitigations at the highest level 
are fairly straightforward. I think the first thing is to accept that actually these kinds of challenges are foreseeable. We certainly don't know how when they will occur and we certainly don't know how often they'll occur and we don't necessarily know how deep the crises will be but we do know that there will be pump priming opportunities coming forward. We know that there will be economic and health crises coming forward as there have been over the last decades. And I think we do need to start to plan for that in the way that police and fire services and others plan for other challenges that face the community. I think the second thing is to invest in data assets and prioritisation of research foci. That is that we need to be sure that we're collecting the right data, but we're joining the data dots. We're actually understanding who's got what data, where it is, and how we might get access to it in order to be able to answer the questions that we need to answer in both preparing for the next challenge and responding to the next challenge. We need to prioritise this, I think, as research foci, particularly in areas like human services, where there is such potential impact on people that are probably more vulnerable than most of us in the community. We also need to think then uh, in the context of sector, government and universities working together towards the identification of current data assets and the bringing together of new data to resolve the issues that we have. I think this has been a particularly important issue uh, for many in the human services sector because we've had quasi-market funding arrangements and other funding arrangements that try and use market economics to resolve uh, some of the wicked problems that we face in this country. While those ideas may or may not be useful, at the end of the day, it does set up a competitive and, if you like, a non-collaborative uh, arrangement uh, is prioritised out of those kinds of funding arrangements. I think the broad human services sector, I think government and universities all need to work together in order to be able to identify that data and use that data to come up with the answers that are needing to be identified. Finally, I think that one of the big issues is that much data is uh, allocated or uh, isolated in various universities and for various reasons that data is either not uh, recognised as existing. In other words, people don't know that it's there and don't know that they might be able to use it. But more importantly, we have a tendency perhaps not to share that data or make sure that there's an open access to that data. Obviously, there are ethical and other implications to this um, uh, comment, and we need to take that into consideration to have a mature response to this kind of idea. But I do think we need to explore more the idea of having open access to data where possible and recognition of where that data lies within organisations, including administrative data that might be in organisations like the Australian Tax Office, health departments, education departments and so on, in order that we've got half a chance of bringing that data together uh, and trying to make it work so that we understand better what's going on and can apply that data to those kinds of resolutions that are needed. That's all I wanted to say. Obviously, I'll come back in uh, in due course, but I'll hand back now to Napa, if I can, please. Thank you, David. That was wonderful. And, you know, the clear message that, you know, the importance of data, data being an asset and not uh, is an asset only when it is can be turned into information is well and clear. And thank you so much for nearly keeping to time. So <laughs> you're getting better each time. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there'll be many questions coming to you. So, um, but without further ado, um, this is my also distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Vinita Godinho, who's also an alumni of RMIT University and a Fulbright Scholar and Managing Director of the newly formed Financial Resilience Australia. Um, Vinita was uh, part of the ANZ's personal risk team. She has also held board roles at Good Shepherd Australia, New Zealand and Good Shepherd Microfinance. And also she has uh, held a ministerial appointment to the Regional Development of Australia's um, Southern Melbourne Committee. She has led the first national cross-sector collaboration to improve Indigenous financial inclusion. And uh, I know Vinita has done some fantastic groundbreaking work around uh, Indigenous um, uh, sense making of uh, businesses and sense making of money. Uh, and um, 
more than 40 organizations she has um, net, has a network with and also taking 650 odd actions to help clients facing hardship. So Winita is indeed a joy to have you here this morning and thank you for being here. The, the, the stage is yours. Not at all. Thank you so much Nava for that very kind introduction. And while I get my slides up and running, I'm remembering what Rohan has told me to do, so I'll get it all into reading view. I'd also take this opportunity to quickly acknowledge country um, and recognize that we are where we are today because of the indigenous leadership that we have. So Nava has put me to the test today and asked me to share my learnings as a practitioner, as someone who has done my research before, has worked in industry, but is now using the opportunity to set up a social enterprise. So the two things that Nava has asked me to look at today is to look at the sustainability of social enterprise in Australia, how we can be resilient within COVID-19, and how we might use technology to provide innovative and cost-effective solutions. So I'm going to use my time today, as David has said, to do translational research and turn that into action and give you some very practical examples of what this looks like for the sector. But before I start, let me just do a quick snapshot of what social enterprise is and what the sector looks like in Australia. So I'll use the social enterprise spectrum, which places social enterprise at the intersection of not-for-profit and business. The definition being that they are purpose-led organizations who earn a majority of their income from trade. So um, what does the sector look like? Well, we know we have around 56,000 registered charities, which I'm no, uh, no doubt Mel will talk a little bit about. They actually bring 155 billion into the Australian economy. Um, and compared to that, we have about 20,000 social enterprises, so it's still a little bit new, um, contributing about 22 billion. So pretty sizable contribution to the economy. Not-for-profits are growing at about 4%. And the bulk of them are small, under a quarter, uh, a quarter of a million or so. 44% actually have no staff, and about 20% are large, over and above a million. Um, social enterprise has been growing at a faster rate, 37% over a five-year period when it was last measured. And they tend to be a bit smaller. So 73% of them are actually small, only 4% are large. Where are they located? Well, um, primarily scattered around the eastern seaboard, as you would expect, but there's very interesting ones. In other states as well. What I find really exciting is that the gender gap for social enterprises, they're more likely to be led by women, which is great because Australia has actually got a larger business um, gender gap for creation of new businesses than global um, gap, which is about four and a half percent. And we also know that by closing the gender gap, Australia can significantly improve GDP, which I find very exciting. Um, the social enterprise sector, two thirds of it is focused on services. Um, about a third of them are like me, very new, between two and five years. And about a third of them are just like me, using new approaches to solve what David called wicked problems, which is the problem of financial exclusion and resilience, which is what I look at. So that's what social enterprise looks like in Australia. And to me, from my personal experience, that actually really marries my own experience, as um, Nava very kindly mentioned. I have started this year as a social entrepreneur, but I have a previous history of working in the financial services industry, in academia, and in not-for-profit. And I must admit that working in social enterprise um, has been a joy, but there are many opportunities that I have of building resilience. So my name is Financial Resilience Australia, and it's all about building resilience, which is the ability to recover from shocks. And the shock that I focus on is financial shocks. So I designed a framework which I had designed for my clients, which is all about how they can recover from financial shocks. And I'll use that framework today to look at how the sector as a whole can respond to the financial shock and, as David mentioned, build back better. So the framework by itself has three simple steps based on disaster recovery um, principles. And I won't bore you with the framework, but I'll actually use its learnings to talk about the sector as a whole. So the first part of this framework is to refocus. When you're faced with a shock, understand the new normal, identify the risks, and look at opportunities which are present. And I must admit that in doing so, research has recently mentioned that the biggest problem that the social enterprise sector and charity sector faces is, of course, funding. Um, the latest research has found that a 20% in cut in charity revenue, which is very, very conceivable, will actually have 88% of the charity sector operating at a loss, 17% closing within six months, and we could lose about 200,000 jobs 
that's a massive um, risk that we've uh, undertaken. Some of the opportunities that we can um, dip into is accelerators and incubators. So I looked at that as well. And I found there's about 40 incubators and accelerators that a social enterprise can tap into. Um, but there are barriers even within that. 17%, 17 of them require the organization to be financially sustainable, which for an early growth enterprise is a bit difficult to achieve. Um, 27 of them actually have some specific location or topic or cohort which they're focusing on. So not everyone might be able to access those. And nine of them have a cost attached to them or require an equity stake. And again, for new startups, that might be a bit difficult to afford. The next um, part of um, what I think our sustainability is threatened by is the ability to continue to offer services to our clients. So that supply chain that Nava has been talking about. The problem here, um, as David mentioned, is not demand. The demand has actually grown. Um, and in fact, we're now seeing a new segment, um, which many charities are commenting on, which have previously never accessed our services. And these are the working poor. They've previously maybe never even had welfare benefits. They are working, but they're not earning enough to make any. And now we are starting to see this sector accessing charity and, not, and social enterprise sector. So we really need to understand them a bit better. Um, why don't we use technology? Well, half of us can't actually afford the technology that we need. Only a third of us actually have an online presence. And even if we could, um, there is a demand side issue here as well, because many of our clients actually don't have access to the technology or they may not be comfortable using it. And there are some privacy and e-security concerns as well. But having said that, one of the silver linings of the COVID crisis, I think, has been the acknowledgement of social capital and social infrastructure along with digital infrastructure. In fact, I've been really pleased to see that technology has been used to maintain social connections and even do things like prevent health issues and concerns. So refocusing by understanding the risks and opportunities that the sector is um, likely to face, I think is an important first step. But the next step will be to refresh, which is to assess the risks and opportunities, prioritize the ones that we can address, and then take a plan of action so that we actually take action to address them. So what are some of these risks? Now the research here is pre-COVID, but I still think that it is quite applicable. So the research found that more than half of the social enterprises actually think that the big, biggest barrier that we have is we don't have the time or capacity to be able to market our services. So marketing of social enterprises is really a priority area. A quarter of us are not financially sustainable, which, as I've mentioned, of course, is a big issue because we won't be able to succeed if we can't be financially sustainable. About a third of us as well haven't been able to measure the social impact that we've got. And to me, this is a real barrier because if you can't demonstrate your value, you're not going to get funding for it. And the reason that we haven't been able to do so, again, comes back to cost and capacity. But along with risks, I always like to look at opportunities as well. So what did the research say were the opportunities that the enterprise sector can look at? And um, some of these are really large. So the biggest one is social procurement. Um, so taking practical steps to make sure that we get to a point where we can tip into social procurement is one of the key growth opportunities for us. The other opportunity is to build capacity of the sector. As David mentioned, capacity and capability is not always available. So 69% of us actually want more development and training. And a large percent of us also want to have a cohesive ecosystem so that there's an ecosystem of support across, the, uh, across Australia as a whole, which I find really interesting as well to take this ecosystem approach. So if that's how we're going to take the next step, which is to prioritize what's the, what the risks and opportunities are for the sector, how can we actually turn and pivot to have some success? So in the last step, which is all about restart, I'd like to share some practical examples of how social enterprise and charities have responded by pivoting their business model in COVID to still remain relevant. So um, a great example in Victoria is collective action. So we've had the food social enterprises collecting together to grow and to offer meals to 30,000 Victorians who are vulnerable, which I find that that collective approach is fantastic to take across the sector. Some others have even joined forces to keep the sector as a whole informed and connected, offering webinars, information, so that we don't feel alone and isolated. Others are partnering with industry partners to continue supporting the clients who need them. So, for example, some very good um, illustrations of large million dollar funding available 
to social enterprises and to charities so that they can keep offering services which are really needed. The second thing that I'd like to talk about is technology and how we can use this for good. So I'd like some examples to be shared about how we're using technology for good. So for example, we have the Salvation Army, which typically has a red shield appeal, door knocking, which was always their way of raising funds for much needed programs. Well, that's gone digital. So instead of knocking on doors, they're knocking on digital doors. And I find that really exciting. And I hope to see really good results from the Red Shield Appeal for the Salvation Army as well. We've got musicians and artists who are not able to have live gigs, actually using technology to offer something to their audience so that it offers a little bit of support to the workers and keeps their audience engaged as well through technology. We've also had some new services. For example, the Red Cross has set up a national new telephone service so that those who are at home and feeling isolated and cannot connect with others have some sort of support during these difficult times. And last but not least, as a banker, I'm really interested to see that the major banks have, have plugged an online digital hole, which was actually allowing online abuse to take place for, for victims of domestic violence. So to me, these are the ways in which a three-step framework can support the sector as a whole to take practical actions so that we remain relevant and are, are able to sustain our services. But the way I look at it, I can't only practice you know, what I preach. I must put this into action myself. So what have I done to do this? Well, I'm taking proactive steps to share my learnings, whatever they might be, through writing, through webinars such as this. I'm developing a theory of change so that I can measure my social impact using sustainable development goals. I put my hand up to join the RMIT's uh, launch hub, so you'll be happy with that, Napa, and I hope I get accepted. And soon, I hope to get certification so that I can tap into social procurement as well. I'm also taking your approach, David, of having an ecosystem approach so that all of us can connect the dots and use the data that we've got to build financial resilience. So I'm enabling every single part of this ecosystem, individuals, families, local neighborhoods and communities, as well as national programs, dipping into global expertise so that we can truly build financial resilience. Last but not least, future research. Nava asked me to share what might be good research topics. So the first one I think is the working poor. I'd really like to understand what this segment looks like, who are they, what are their barriers and enablers, and how can the not-for-profit sector better support their needs? And the second thing I'd really like to do some research on is how to measure our impact. Can we use donut economics? Can we use a consistent framework such as sustainable development goals so that we can truly demonstrate the impact that not-for-profits and the social enterprise sector has to offer to Australia? And on that note, I hope Nava I've met your 15 minute <laughs> timeline and I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Wonderful, thank you, Vinita. Excellent presentation. Um, and everything I expected from you, spot on. I love your three step um, proposition. Uh, very much looking forward to working with you as we move, um, in, as, as we go forward, I mean. Um, but I'm sure you'll also be getting quite a few uh, questions towards the end of uh, our session. Uh, and now, last but not the least for sure, it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Mel Yates, who is the um, director of, it's a very long title, Mel, but it's a very interesting one because you promised so much. The director of reporting rate tape reduction at the ACNC or the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Corporate Services. Uh, Mel um, leads the collection of reporting from charities with a focus on reducing unnecessary, unnecessary regulatory uh, obligations and ensures the ACNC has sound corporate governance arrangements. Uh, he is also currently serving as the divisional counsellor and chair of the public sector and not-for-profit committee at CPA Australia. Mel, it's indeed a, um, a privilege and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making time. I know you've got a very busy schedule, but thank you for making time to be with us. And the floor is yours, Mel. Thank you so much, Nava. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you, Nava. Thank RMIT for the opportunity to participate in today. And I'm going to get some assistance from Rohan, who's going to be my slide master. 
so that uh, I can just focus on the talking. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which all of us meet across Australia, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I'll be providing some context uh, in relation to the regulator and what we are sort of seeing in terms of the impact of COVID. And then I'll dive into a little bit more information specifically around human service organisations. So if you can't see the slides, there we go. Great. So we'll move to the next one. Thank you, Rohan. I guess the, the point I want to make is this is what the ACNC does. And the second extended box there is around the register that we maintain. Charities are required each year to provide reporting to the ACNC. And this is the information which we make available on the register. And we also make available through data.gov.au. So there is a lot of data available, which you can turn into information about the charity sector in Australia. So the longer we exist and the more reporting we collect, the more information is visible in terms of trends and timelines and using the information to start to get better insights about the charitable sector over a period of time. Now, this is a national, what I consider a national data asset. So all of the information on data.gov.au about registered charities is available free of charge. People can go and use that information for research purposes, for the development of policy, for any myriad of different uh, intents. So we'll move to the next slide. So I just want to play a very, very quick uh, video, if you can play that. And this just sort of sets the scene for the charitable sector in Australia. So... Thank you so much, Rohan. So in Australia, we have currently just over 58,000 registered charities. These are across any number of um, different parts of the sector. And obviously charities in Australia are required to meet a raft of conditions for entitlement. And that includes meeting one of the charitable subtypes. Now, one of the charity subtypes that I wanna focus on on the next slide is really those charities which are advancing social and public welfare. Now, I would think, I would link that charitable subtype with the human services um, sector in Australia. So effectively, social and public welfare charities, they generally support um, the community, whether that's through people living with disabilities, residential aged care, some housing providers, they cover a range of different services. Now, in terms of their, uh, I guess, their positioning within the sector, when we look at the sector in, in totality and moving back to that little video that was played, social and public welfare organisations have a very different makeup of their revenue sources. So they rely less on government and grants. They rely more on donations and bequests. They rely more on the provision of goods or services for their income. They rely more on investments for part of their revenue. And their other revenue, which isn't categorised into the things that I've just mentioned, is slightly higher than the rest of the sector. Now, we've had a very interesting time over the last 12 months. We were experiencing drought. Obviously, the horrendous bushfires saw a spike in generosity and some organisations really benefited from large amounts of donations from the community and across the world, to be honest. So that was quite incredible. And when we thought things were crazy and terrible and we were on our knees, what else could possibly go wrong? And we find ourselves dealing with COVID-19. 
So I'll move to the next slide, Rohan. So in terms of some of the issues that uh, human service organisations are experiencing, I've grouped them into some sort of headlines. Now, there's obvi the obvious health issues, um, distancing and making sure that staff, volunteers have personal protective equipment, making sure that uh, there's enough people. So what we've seen from charities is that many people who volunteer, and there's around uh, 3.7 million volunteers that support the charity sector, from the 2018 Charities Report, many of those volunteers fall into the vulnerable categories and they're actually unable to participate in the activities that they were doing in support of human service organisations. So we've seen a potentially a drop of people being able to assist and we've also seen the challenges of remote, remote working and some people not being able to physically attend certain locations because of their vulnerabilities. We've also seen restrictions on visitors. So many organisations have had to change the way they operate to deal with the COVID-19 um, constraints that have been placed upon them. Moving to the economic impacts, these are by far, I think, uh, yet to actually settle and we're actually uh, just seeing the start of the economic impacts on the sector. We've already talked about an increase in demand. So many organisations are seeing massive increases in requests for assistance. So their beneficiary base is expanding or their beneficiary base is seeking more from these organisations. We've seen a drop in donations. So JB Weir did some research that, that found donations would fall by around 7% this year, but would fall by a further 12% next year. So this is not a short term issue. This is going to flow through the sector over many, many years into the future. Many organisations rely on fundraising. Many fundraising events have had to be cancelled because they cannot have gatherings of people. If we think about, and Vanita's already talked about this, the Red Shield appeal, they've had to pivot and change the way they fundraise. And that's right across the sector. We've also seen, um, uh, I guess, a change in the way people are giving. So there is less cash around. More and more of us are using our electronic means for payment. So that is also having an impact on traditional charities and the rattling of the tin and having to change the way that organisations collect those donations. Now, the economic impact you could argue has been helped by some policies, i.e. JobKeeper. But when we look at the information that's being reported by the media, only around one in five charitable organisations are benefiting from JobKeeper because only half of charities employ people. And we've also got the challenges of people having to nominate one employer. So if there is someone working across multiple charities, they can only claim JobKeeper from one of those organisations that employs them. So there's some real challenges around the economic impacts um, that are facing charities. In terms of the wellbeing impacts, I don't think we see or we know what that impact is going to be for the sector and for beneficiaries. So if we think about um, uh, if we think about the isolation that people are having, the lack of interaction, the move in technology to virtual events, the inherent nature of meeting someone and wanting to shake their hand, or if someone's having a rough time, wanting to give them a hug. That is exactly what we are being advised by our top health experts not to do. We shouldn't be physically touching each other. We should be distancing. So I think there are some wellbeing impacts that are going to continue to be felt into the future. In terms of some organisational governance aspects, this is really something uh, that we have been trying to work on guidance and support for the sector because 
the traditional way of organisations running has changed the way records need to be kept. The use of technology, people are remote working, volunteers not being able to attend a physical location, that all has an impact on the records that an organisation is required to maintain to ensure good governance. So these are all challenges that the sector is having to grapple with. If I also think about the security elements, privacy elements, if people are working from home, do they have sufficient security and systems in place to make sure that the organisation is not put in risk of non-compliance with requirements that need to be met or being infiltrated by uh, people that are trying to attack the governance of organisations and steal information? The accountability aspect of, of something is really important. There is a governance standard that all charities need to meet, and that is accountability to members. Now, the traditional annual general meeting for many organisations, that can't take place because of distancing requirements. So organisations are having to think about how they run meetings virtually, how they communicate information to members, how they make provision for members to participate in the governance of the organisation and to ensure accountability and ask questions and have information shared with them. These are all really, really practical challenges that many organisations are working through. And certainly as a regulator, we have provided some support um, and some resources around that. And other regulators as well have been trying to grapple with what they do to support organisations to continue that accountability to the membership and to other stakeholders of all organisations. Just a very quick point uh, in terms of pivoting purpose. So uh, Vanita talked a little bit about some organisations changing what they do. We've made a, a podcast available about a charity that was creating prosthetic limbs and prosthetic um, items that people needed uh, they have pivoted their organisation to produce personal protective equipment and they did that by contacting the ACNC, making changes to their governing document. So they followed all of the steps that they needed to to pivot their organisation to support this crisis. So that's another example uh, that can be looked at as, a, I guess, a, a good example of what organisations have done, making sure that they're continuing to comply with their governance requirements while responding to the pandemic. And I think it's really important that just because an organisation might have volunteers or staff working remotely, there are still obligations for that organisation in terms of workplace health and safety, wellbeing, making sure people have the equipment they need, the systems they need, making sure that they're not feeling isolated. So it's not just handballing the uh, responsibilities to people um, so that they self-manage. The organisation still has requirements in relation to that. Move to the next uh, slide, please, Rohan. So I guess in terms of some of the support that we've provided, uh, we have provided and set up a dedicated website trying to provide information around all the stakeholders that registered charities might need. We have given an information statement extension. So all information statements due from the 12th of March to the 30th of August are now due on the 31st of August. So that's a practical thing that we can do. But many charities have other obligations and our extension at the ACNC does not automatically carry over, for example, to state or territory requirements. So charities need to be aware of that. We've temporarily provided some flexibility in terms of meeting governance standards and the external conduct standards. And what we have done is effectively mirrored the changes that were made to the Corporations Act. So they were around insolvency. We've also expressed some flexibility around changing purposes short term and uh, record keeping and the like. So these are in response to practical issues that we know charities are going to face. Now, I've already talked about JobKeeper, so I think we've covered that too much. Just moving forward very briefly before I wrap up. Our previous presenters have talked about data and information. So what we're trying to do at the ACNC is help get 
high quality data to the most number of people to help inform the understanding of what charities do in the sector more broadly. So what we're going to do through this is when the information statement is launched for 2020, later this calendar year, we are going to change some of the questions around what a charity does, the programs it runs, who the beneficiaries are, and where those programs are run. So there will be some tweaks to some of the questions. That's to try and help people engage easier with the charity register and with what charities do. We will obviously continue to produce guidance and resources as required, and that's to support charities through the evolving crisis that we face. That's it. Thank you so much, Nava. I'll hand back. Thank you, Mel. That's wonderful. Thank you. So good to see a regulator actually uh, having impact on, um, on, the, on the industry. Um, now, I think one of the things that um, I picked up there is that risk around cybersecurity for a lot of the uh, not-for-profit and charities, people working from home. Um, you know, we have a new centre on cybersecurity actually led by Professor Matt Warren. I'm very, very pleased to say. And so we might have more chats on, on, on that point. But uh, thank you. That was very, very um, uh, informative. Um, now, very quickly, just taking a couple of minutes before we go into uh, Q and A is I'd like to invite my colleague Dr. Tarek Rana, uh, who is a senior lecturer in our school, and he teaches and researches in the area of management accounting and public sector accounting. To to do a few uh, wrap up synopsis uh, dot points on um, wrap on the wrap up of the uh, webinar. Tarek, thank you, oops, thank you, Nava. I, I like to begin with a very big uh, thank you to Professor um, uh, David Gilchrist, uh, Dr. Uh, Vinita uh, Good uh, Winho, and uh, Mr. Mel uh, Yates for your fantastic and incredibly uh, enlightening and uh, interesting presentation today. So, no doubt all of our colleagues have picked up so many things from your presentations that will probably give us food for thought for many years to come. I, I, I know I, I don't have too much time. Nava gave me only two minutes. There are lots of key things that uh, that I, I, I took a note and, 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 and I just like to summarize um, by saying few cures that that came uh, came probably uh, in three of your presentations. So the words like resilience, supply chain, sustainability, opportunity, risk, um, uh, or accountability performance. So rather than addressing these key uh, words individually and, and speaking, speaking to um, uh, our speaker individually, I'm trying to wrap them up in a kind of a, a theme that I think that that is one of the emerging theme and I'm sure our colleagues will be uh, picking up lots of other themes as well. So what you have highlighted today is that NFP organizations are experiencing um, an unique and, 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 and increased demand of their service delivery when less is more. Everything is less, but they, they are expected to deliver things in, in more. As, as Mel said, this is not a short term, but, but it's a long term situation. Also, the recent uh, crisis, uh, the COVID has highlighted the need for focus uh, in terms of resilience and, and, and sustainability. And I'd like to pick up on uh, Professor Gilchrist's notion of ecosystem. So what I'm going to see, uh, say is, is a supply chain because I'm, I'm a management accounting researcher and I understand ecosystem as a supply chain um, a management or supply chain activities. So what I think you are telling us that we need to engage more with the supply chain because only then NFP will giving more attention uh, the ways in which they can develop this um, relationship in terms of collaboration, trust, um, and, and developing their business model accordingly. And in this way, they'll become more effective in terms of uh, living a new way in, 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 in the ecosystem, right? So when I say ecosystem, I mean, I think I picked up from three of your um, speeches that you talked about government, state government, federal government, customers, donors, volunteers, suppliers, like all uh, policy regulation and accountability demands. So these, all of these outcomes can be achieved if we can develop a framework underlying with this notion of ecosystem or, or supply chain. And one of the thing I just like to throw in there is uh, from my perspective, I think risk management can be one 
one of the framework that we can deploy. So I like uh, Vinita's three step model, and I like to offer another framework very quickly that if we think risk management is a um, framework that can underline um, uh, like, you know, uh, data assets and convert them into business intelligence, right? You know, doing business analytics and then informing our control system within the organization. And those control system will be able to address the the supply chain activities dealing with all these partners and 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 actors. And at the end, it will enhance the sustainability and resilience of our NFPs. And by doing that, we'll be able to improve performance and and accountability. So that's that's in very very quick summary because I don't have a lot of time. But I think these type of things I think we'll be picking up from your talk and and move ahead and try to do some practice focused research with our industry partners. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek, for that. And I also want to very quickly acknowledge the wonderful support we've got from uh, Rohan, from uh, Yeshwant Buruth and Sarah Carstens in putting all of this together. Thanks, guys. You're a great team to be working with. Um, OK, do we have any specific questions? If you do, just raise your hands. There's a on the bar. There's the raise your hands and you can ask a question and you can turn on your um, mic as well. Uh, we have until 12.15 for questions, Q&A time. Um, actually, I, I would like to start off with a question, um, which is, David, you, the, the suggestion you have shared, and that goes with Mel and Venita as well, Data as an asset, you know, um, how do we get get that data, a collection of data that has integrity, that has, you know, that is uh, as accurate as possible to make yeah. those important decisions? Any ideas and suggestions? Certainly. I mean, in one respect, it's a million dollar question, as we all know, but I think there's two levels to my response. The first one, I, I guess, for want of a better term, is a philosophical level. And that really says that we spend billions and billions of dollars each year on human services in this country, but we fail to invest in the infrastructure around the expenditure of that billions on the basis that it's inefficient uh, to do so. And I think there's two further comments around that. Number one is I think the amount of money spent on planning and developing the infrastructure is nowhere near sufficient in the context of how much money is spent. But I think too that we as a nation, and perhaps this is a, a global or a Western world issue as well, is that we seem to conflate the words efficient and cheap. That is, cheap is efficient. Well, something's only efficient uh, if you achieve the outcome you're intending to achieve for the least amount of resources. So I think there's a, a, a group of philosophical things that we all have to come to groups with before we move forward. I think the second thing is that we have to um, think about the economic structure of the delivery of human services and what I consider to be our grossly over-reliant uh, over reliance on market economics as being the be all and end all in terms of all of our activities. And I need to say, you know, I'm not a roaring communist. Uh, what I am, I think, is a pragmatic accountant that says that we need to adopt the economic model that works most efficiently and effectively. And my uh, belief is, uh, after being in the sector for um, almost 30 years, is that at the end of the day, markets don't resolve these questions or market appro approaches don't resolve these questions, collaborative approaches resolve these questions. And for what I think is really a minimal investment, we can bring together industry, regulators, peak bodies uh, and governments to be able to work much more closely with the allocation of funding and with the um, ability to measure things like outcomes and to, um, to achieve an outcome that's going to make sense. I think the final point I'll make, uh, and I'm making up on that 15 minutes, is the um, at the end of the day too, we are, I think appropriately all ensconced in trying to deliver choice and control to people who use services. And I think that's a very, very important ambition for us to continue to pursue. But the only way to do that is to actually turn the decision making framework on its head and have decisions made locally rather than nationally or at the state level. And I think that's the final point that I would make is that we need to refocus how we make decisions 
and therefore what data and information we deliver to people making decisions at that coalface rather than in Canberra, for instance. Okay. Um, David, there's nothing more dangerous than a, than a pragmatic accountant. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have a handout from uh, Mr. Tim Roach. Tim, are you there? Can you unmute and ask your question? I am, yeah. I think so. This is like I was, a, as I've done some work with David. So, David knows I'm, I'm only recently an academic and I was a public servant for many years. Um, but I recall back in 2017, the Productivity Commission uh, called for an expansion in the data sharing across the sectors, both public, private, not for profit. Um, at that time, uh, that I was you know, heavily supportive of it in my previous role. But has it have things moved since then? Have things improved? Are we because we still seem to be seeing these these same data sharing issues that were raised in that report? I know. Mel, do you want to take that before David takes? Questions? Sure. So I am. I'm not familiar with the actual Productivity Commission report that you're talking about, but I know that there is intent from government to legislate for certainly public service organisations to, I guess, step up to help with data sharing, to make data available to each other and where possible to try and, and make it available to the broader community. Now, that I understand has been stalled because of what's happened with COVID, obviously. So the legislative agenda is on hold effectively. But I'm expecting that that will have traction later in the year, possibly next year. But that's that's just indications. So I think I, I think you're right. I think it's important that data does need to be shared, made available. Um, that's really all I can contribute to that question, though. David, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I'm delighted to uh, to contribute. I think uh, it's a great question, and Tim and I have worked and uh, worked together and discussed some of this. And I think the Productivity Commission's um, output uh, was a really useful piece, but it didn't inform practice is, is the reality. And I think there's two things that are important to consider in that regard. The first one is the data is not information. Um, so we can collect and collect and collect, but we're not necessarily using that that data to create information that answers questions. I think the second thing, and the ACNC establishment's a great example here, and this is before Mel's timer, um, but I remember very, very um, clearly back when the ACNC task force was created and we're trying to work out what to put in the AIS, um, what questions to be asked, we didn't start from a what questions need to be answered perspective. We started from what I would term a traditional public sector administrative data collection process. Now that data is important, but uh, I think Mel um, and I have had many discussions on this as well, and and it's really pleasing to hear Mel uh, and his team doing as much as they can to try and get that AIS data to be more useful. But I think that that's the second thing that's really important is that when we collect data, it's got to actually be you turned into information and returned back to those organisations that provide it. I think that's the the covenant that goes with asking for people to put their time and effort into delivering proper data. And my experience of data collection with things like the Disability Sustainability Project, Long Term Sustainability Project, is the more people get, the more hard work they put into providing the right data and correct data. Um, Thanks, I have a question here before before I call Prane. There's a question here from Ida that says this question is for Melville. Vinita said that most charities cannot afford technology and that makes them vulnerable. Can not can't ACNC go beyond assurance and support charities to invest in their infrastructure? And I think I know the answer for that one, Mel, but so there are, I mean, it's well known that the, the broader sector struggles to invest and adapt and adopt and maintain technology. There are organisations that specifically help not-for-profit entities and charities adopt technology at lower prices than commercial organisations pay. Um, I am aware that some of the, the largest household names that are technology companies, they also have a very active part of their business in supporting the not-for-profit sector. So we can't really do that directly. That would be, um, there'd be a lot of barriers to doing that, 
but there certainly are organisations that specifically, their purpose is specifically to help the not-for-profit sector and charities adopt technology at a, a reduced price than what would otherwise be commercially paid. Um, okay, uh, thanks Mel. Uh, Prem, you have got your hand up. Prem? Uh uh, yeah, thank you, Now, but I, I would like to thank the panel for this exciting talk today. Um, very thought-provoking uh, discussion here. Um, my question related to the, the privacy and confidentiality, con confidentiality of data, uh, particularly in reference to, to COVID app, uh, they've been collecting data on that software. Uh, do you really see any concern, major concerns in terms of data sharing and, 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 and uh, optimal utilization of those sorts of data, which is very rich, and to a uh, to, to a, a disaggregate level, individual level? Um, what sort of uh, concerns do you think would potentially pose, uh, create problems for for a society? I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in um, uh, if that's all right with you, uh, Nava. But I, I think that's a really, a really important question. Um, and I think there are a number of caveats around, particularly probably my presentation in the context of data collection and data, open data sources. But I come back to my central proposition too, that data is not information. And I think if we have a stock take on what data is collected by whom, we can also sheet home where questions might be answered. In other words, and I'll put, you know, just using the ACNC because Mel's here, I might not be able to get access and it might not be appropriate for me to get access to certain information that the ACNC collects on certain things, but it's good to be able to go to Mel and know to, that I can go to Mel to get answers on particular questions. So. I think there's a, a vast difference between getting access to my personal tax records uh, as opposed to getting access to the top line income and expenditure, uh, BAS collected, PAYG uh, collected by the tax office, which would give us a very, very clear understanding of what changes have, has occurred in the not-for-profit and charitable sector, sector as a result of COVID. So that data is there. It's accessible. We shouldn't get access to individual organisations' tax data, but we can get answers to questions. The administrative data is there. Um, can I ask, Anita, um, how do you see? I, I know this is a passion of yours, and I think they're very important that the Indigenous communities um, also, and Indigenous not for profit organisations, social enterprises, and remote communities. Um, how can they be helped? Well, you know, that's almost like a $64 billion question, Nava. You know, <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are so many aspects to um, helping organizations, particularly those who are based in a remote area. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, that we engage indigenous led community um, change instead of imposing it from the outside, that we make the time and effort to make sure that it is the local priorities which are being, um, you know, prioritized and that the local people are being given the opportunity to lead the change rather than jumping into another sector and, you know, repeat the same process which has been going on, which is that, you know, people come in from the outside and try and lead change, whereas in order to be sustainable, change has to be led from the inside. Um, and the second one, of course, is always funding. So, you know, I think that funders need to take a longer term view and not just fund small little projects which go for short periods of time. Remembering that change takes a long period, particularly in remote communities where the community as a whole has to be able to adapt to the change. And that takes time. If, if there were just two things I could say, it would be one, let the communities engage themselves and decide what they want and prioritize and two, to be patient for change. Well, very, very wise words, Vinita. We have got last one, two questions here because our time is, we've got what, roughly one minute left. But the question here is, uh, and I'll surmise these are long questions, but what, how, what do you, how do you see blockchain uh, supporting or, you know, in this COVID-19 situation, the not-for-profit sector, especially around the issues of data integrity and data sharing? 
Anyone want to speak then? Oh, well, I, I think I think a couple of things. I think there's um, a number of um, of um, technology responses to these kinds of issues that can help us be efficient and effective. Blockchain is one. I think SBR is the num another. You know, there's not this sector is a fantastic sector for testing SBR and using SBR. I think the third one is taking a more um, um, appropriate approach to the audit process. And I think that would be helpful. So at the moment, we audit financial reports, as we know, and, and this may be challenging to some people. But at the end of the day, I think audit the audit dollar can be better spent looking at um, not so much the financial report, but more the financial operations of organisations. So I think all of these things have great potential for investment in the sector and, and for achieving real outcomes. Um, absolutely. Last question here. Uh, then, and, you know, people are most welcome, I'm sure, to write to you or, you know, write to us and we can field uh, these questions as we go uh, you know, forward. But the last question here is, what about the issue that funders often will fund projects, but not staff or people? It's that, that, that administrative cost issue. Yeah. So I might jump in and, and just provide a very, my five cents worth. The ACNC position is that, that it that doesn't make a lot of sense because you have to invest in governance. An organisation must have appropriate governance if it is to be successful and not be susceptible to risk, to be resilient and all of those things to be able to provide good services to the beneficiaries that it is designed to serve and support. So we have issues with this and that's why we challenge comments around uh, ratios and um, administration costs and all of those sorts of things. At the end of the day, an organisation must invest in itself. There's, there's a, there's obviously there's limits on how much should be invested. The organisation should be achieving its purpose, but it also has to invest in making sure that it is appropriately run and the governance is in place. So that's what I would say to that question. So and I might jump in there, but one last thing I'd say is having worked in the sector, I think we'd like to make sure that people understand that we are not for profit, but we're not not for cost. So, you know, we work, we are staff just like anyone else. We need to be paid and we need to pay our people. So, you know, it, to me, it's a misnomer that you think that we should be able to offer services at no cost. Yeah. So excellent fine, final thoughts. Uh, David, Vinita, Mel, in that order for what would you like to communicate to our audience today? Oh, look, I, I think all of the points of, uh, of my colleague's presentation and hopefully my own make uh, sense to people. But I think the most important thing is a collaborative approach to resolving the structural issues that we're facing as a sector. Okay. Vinita? Well, I'm an action lady, so for me, I would say absolutely you're right. Um, David, I would like to have something that allows us to collaborate. So let's think of ways in which all of the sectors can combine our knowledge and do something that really makes a difference on the ground. And now? And I'll just close off by saying that we will try as an organisation, we are a data organisation, that's what we see ourselves as. And so we're trying where possible to make as much data and information available in a meaningful way that others can use. Thank you so much. You, you, you've done me proud and, and all the comments that we've been getting, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, at, but everyone's been really appreciative and I think the not-for-profit sector in particular always is, feels like a second cousin to the private sector but I think there's so much more value that comes out of this uh, sector and that all of our efforts and our commitment to the sector uh, and your commitment to the sector I thank you and thank you everyone as well who joined us today and let us all clap with it. I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm sure you'll hear my clap. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll catch up with you guys. Soon. Thank you.